Boa tarde, bem-vindo a todos. Nós estamos iniciando aqui o terceiro e último dia. Eu não sei se, eu não sei se o meu bom dia saiu, se a, se a gravação do YouTube pegou, vou repetir, gente. Boa tarde a todos, tá? sejam muito bem-vindos ao terceiro e último dia da, da conferência sobre a A desse ano, 2022. Essa é a nossa terceira edição. E esse ano nós temos um convidado muito especial, que é o Dr. David Shoemaker, que vai fazer uma apresentação para nós. A gente acabou de fazer os últimos ajustes que foram necessários aqui com a apresentação, então acabamos é, iniciando exatamente no horário. A apresentação do Dr. David vai ser feita em inglês, tá, gente? Então a gente está contando com a qualidade da, das legendas automáticas do YouTube para o caso de o idioma inglês não ser acessível. Right, David, thank you for being with us here today. It's a great honor. Everybody has been expecting your, your talk very much. Thank you very we much. Already have, we already have many uh, appreciative comments here. <laughs> and uh, and uh, without further delay, uh, I give you the word. All right. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, seeing lots of names in the in the chat, so I know we've got uh, a lot of people uh, here. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, my uh, my purpose for today is to share my own experiences with uh, scrying the 38 ers of the Enochian system. Um, and the, the overarching reason for doing that and for discussing it in the way I want to discuss it today is that I want to look at why we would undertake this kind of visionary work as a part of our personal path, but also the importance of each of us doing that and sharing our results uh, in due time as a way of keeping the system of AA and, and the system of scientific Illuminism generally alive and um, helping humanity with our own work. Um, there are many ways that the personal path ends up being a path of service to all humanity, of course, not simply, not only, um, visionary work like this, um, any personal development in the path of AA, ultimately, in my view, is an act of service. Um, we don't simply engage in this work. We don't truly engage in this work purely for our own benefit. I think you've probably in, encountered in your own path and in you know, others that you've worked with, um, that sometimes when we start this work, we we want to have great power or we want to be able to, you know, do all the cool things we think magicians do. But um, that tends to wear off fairly quickly when we actually dig into our to our transformation, the transformation of the self. And we soon discover that all of these powers and um, tools that were built in the path of AA are ultimately um, designed to bring us to knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel, but in doing so, to bring us in harmony with our true will and therefore in harmony with the will of the universe and therefore um, to be of service to all of humanity and, and living that will out. So um, in the system of AA, as you know, um, the, the Enochian corpus uh, of, of work is uh, primarily presented as Liber Hanok. Um, there's not a whole lot in there formally uh, in terms of training and testing on Enochian work. This uh, ends up being the kind of thing that varies somewhat depending on the specialty of the supervising initiate um, that a, a given individual might have. It depends somewhat on the personal interests of an initiate. I can imagine some um, aspirants of AA tend to focus on Enochian. Some might decide that their particular 
um, what particularly appeals to them is some other aspect of magical practice, such as Solomonic work or something else. Um, so not everyone's going to be an expert at everything, but I think everyone in AA eventually uh, across the the grades of the, um, needs to be familiar with these tools to some degree. Um, so um, let me talk about why I think it's so important that we do this work uh, and kind of thumbnail um, why why I think uh, each of us needs to engage in it for maximum um, benefit of ourselves and the world. Uh, okay, I've already mentioned that doing this kind of visionary work uh, serves the system as a whole, right? It serves, it keeps the AA as a living system that isn't merely a calcified dead set of practices that are 120 years old and never change and never evolve and um, don't benefit from the ongoing work that we're all doing. Um, if you if you look at the way Crowley set up the system, you can tell that he felt it was important to maintain the, the hallmarks, the landmarks of the system, the way that Lieber 185 sets the testing and training tasks and, and so on. Uh, you can felt it was important for these core documents, additional documents of AA to be in there. Um, you can all that he would not have liked the idea that research stops, you know, and that's one, one of the great things about, about the, this conference and conferences like this is that you're clearly looking at what each new aspirant bring to the, the work and how the the AA work actually expands and grows based on the uniqueness of each person following the system. And I think I appreciated that um, perhaps he wouldn't have liked the idea that's after him and do a better job at something than he did. But um, I, I think uh, for any system to grow over time, that has to happen to do better than the people who came before us and the people who come after us have to do better than we are. Otherwise, uh, it's it, it's not good. It's not not a good recipe for for evolution. Um, so it keeps the AA a living system for us to be doing this kind of visionary work and research. It also creates and sustains the inner contacts, um, at least for a magician using these tools competently, um, who has worked on themselves to get where they can make genuinely make these contacts with the entities being scried or, or otherwise explored. Um, but as we all work the system of AA, the more of us forge and maintain plane contacts, fuel uh, at that astral level that is available for the order itself. Uh, and one is extremely important an additional reason that we do this work is that the work itself the work of scrying the 30 aethers in particular in my view is initiatory scrying these regions creates sustains um, potentiates the initiatory experience of the person doing it and i'm going to talk in a lot more detail about how i found that to be true for myself um, but I think you can you can probably verify from your own experience so far, whatever you've been doing, that when you start to do certain work, it requires you to um, to grow. You know, if you're doing if you put yourself intentionally to and seriously into a body of magical work, uh, in order to master it, in order to do it successfully, you will change. And quite simply, initiation is transformation. It's a change process that's intentional. Um, and scrying these aethers sequentially, I think, is one of the best examples in the AA system of a set of tools that make you grow. Okay. 
to start sharing my screen now. So I'm going to be unable to see comments um, since all I'll see is my own slideshow. But um, I know the organizers are going to uh, pop in uh, audio uh, wise and interrupt me if, if I need to stop and address a comment. We will have time for most of our questions uh, at the end, of course. Okay, so in postcards to, yes. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but just so you know, uh, your slides are not full screen. We can see the controls. I think it's okay, right? It's not a problem. We can read the word, it's very clear, but it's not in fact a full screen. You're seeing buttons. Yeah, we can see the the, 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 the the right panel saying direction and duration and yes, now it's full screen, great. Okay, great, thank you for letting me know. Um, in postcards to probationers, Crowley outlines some of the value of doing visionary work and I just wanted to briefly review that. The world progresses by virtue of the appearance of Christ's or geniuses. Christ's geniuses are humans with superconsciousness of the highest order. Superconsciousness of the highest order is obtainable by known methods. Therefore, by employing the quintessence of known methods, we cause the world to progress. Theology is immaterial for both Buddha and St. Ignatius were Christ's. Morality is immaterial for both Socrates and Muhammad were Christ's. Superconsciousness is a natural phenomenon. Its conditions are therefore to be sought rather in the acts than the words of those who attain it. The essential acts are retirement and concentration as taught by yoga and ceremonial magic. Since truth is super rational, it is incommunicable in the language of reason. Hence, all mystics have written nonsense, and what sense they have written is so far untrue. Yet, as a still lake yields a truer reflection of the sun than a torrent, he whose mind is best balanced will, if he become a mystic, become the best mystic. And that is really our goal here, uh, to use the, the aethers of the Enochian system, the scrying of those aethers, as a way of refining our ability to tap into superconsciousness and become the best mystic we can be. And by best here, I think what Crowley's implying and what I believe is that um, when we refine our ability to receive this information at a super rational level, we have the best view of truth we have the view of truth that is least adulterated by our uh, ego. We have the greatest degree of that ego transparency that we seek uh, so that we can be a vessel for that truth without coloring it too much with our own expectations, our own biases, our own preferences. So being the best mystics we can be is one way to look at our goal with all of this and why we would bother to use mysticism as a means of our own personal growth and the growth of humanity. Now, I know that um, many of you are acquainted with the Enochian system. Some may not be, uh, some may be less acquainted with the system of the 30 Aethers. So I'm gonna do a, a little bit of background on that just to cover my bases. Um, so forgive me if this is uh, repeating material that you already know, but I wanna make sure we're all in the same place in uh, terms of uh, starting with the Enochian discussion. So uh, John Dee, of course, is one of the pivotal figures um, 
involved here. The 30 aethers are one of the three major components of the Enochian system that was developed by John Dee and Edward Kelly uh, in 15, beginning in 1582. The other two parts of the system being the four elemental watchtowers and the uh, heptarchic system, but we're focusing on the 30 aethers here. Um, all of the aspects of the system have their origin in what we would call um, today channeled communications or the sort of scryed communications with angelic beings. Uh, Dee and Kelly transcribed the communications and expanded the system. Here's uh, some of their working tools, which are still um, on permanent display at the British Museum in London. Um, I'm always happy to make repeated trips over there and, and see that they're still out there on display. Um, so try to get over there and see that if you possibly can during your lifetime at some point. The interesting thing is that while Dee and Kelly developed this system, they never really worked it fully. Um, they left a lot of things unexplored. And it took people like uh, Alistair Crowley to pick up the pieces there. Um, this is the Enochian alphabet and some of the attributions to the alphabet, um, including numerical value, the English equivalents, and the so-called Yetzeratic attributions, the astrological um, attributions, um, which imply tarot card attributions as well. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But this system was codified largely by the Golden Dawn and has been refined over the, the last 120 years by the successor orders that have followed the Golden Dawn, including uh, Temple of the Silver Star. Uh, Crowley had his initial exposure and training in the Enochian system um, via the Golden Dawn, uh, and that planted the seeds of his own visionary work in the Vision and the Voice, which is, the, of course, the document where he recorded his vision of the 30 Aethers. It's very clear when you look at um, his progress through those Aethers and his own discussion of that progress that this was the work that was uh, that he deemed to be important initiatory important initiatory work for him to get him um, up to and across the abyss and, and so on. So that's the the level of work that is possible through this system. I'm not saying that anyone who scries 30 aethers becomes uh, a magister templi, but um, it can happen. I I have not worked with I mean, I've, I've worked with a lot of systems of initiation. I've worked with a lot of initiatory processes, but I have never undertaken a scrying work that was as potent as the 30 Aethers in terms of my own personal initiatory work. Um, when I set out to do it, uh, this was in 2007. When I set out to do it, uh, I thought maybe, you know, okay, 30 Aethers, and I'd probably repeat each one or possibly repeat each one and get through, you know, one every other day, maybe. So I figured about two months would be all I would need. Um, as it turned out, it uh, took four years. And um, one of the reasons it took four years is that it is initiatory. I would do an Aether, I would have a vision and, um, plan on continuing right away. Um, I would try to incorporate the instructions, information in the vision I'd had, and then plan on, you know, the next day or soon after taking the next step. But what continually happened over and over was that there would be gaps. I would take a few weeks or sometimes even a few months before doing the next one. But then when I would do the next one, I realized that the time that it elapsed was required for me to actually grow in certain ways. Um, it would be clear from the next vision that, that that would give me full understanding of what was instructed in the previous vision. So I would realize that, oh, it, when it was saying, you know, to, it was giving me th these symbols and these instructions in the last Aether, that meant that I needed to grow in this particular way in between before I could even do the, the, the next one. 
and it often took me you know through the process of getting to the next one before i realized fully what had happened to me to change me in the meantime sometimes that did coincide with actual grade advancements within aa um, i did this work after my knowledge and conversation working in 2004. Um, so this was i was undertaking this as as an expansion of my five six work and um, the grades beyond the work that i did here and the 38 there's the instructions that came through the symbols that came through became an integral part of me taking my own attainment out into the world and trying to do something with it this is the the work of transitioning from five equals six to six equals five from adeptus minor to adeptus major and i'm talking about this this work in theory i'm i'm not here to publicly claim grades or anything but i'm trying to to give you some context as best i can um so around this time is when I founded the Temple of the Silver Star. Uh, and of course, I was already administering AA. But um, this visionary work allowed me to bring in uh, uh, more material to the work of AA and Temple of the Silver Star that would not have been there, uh, that I could not personally have thought of or created. The nature of the material that came through uh, in the visionary work of my knowledge and conversation retirement uh, and that came through in the aether scryings was of a quality and character that I recognized as coming from outside of myself. You can argue that this was just some part of me that I was not in touch with, but the experience was definitely one of this is coming from outside me. Um, and I'll say a little bit more about verifying that in a minute. At the time of doing these workings, these visions, I was not fluent in spoken Enochian. I'd worked with the language. I'd worked with the tablets a lot in, in my Temple of the Silver Star work um, and the broader tradition. But I didn't. I would. I would not have understood someone speaking Enochian to me. So what started to happen was that in these visions, the guides that I would find there would speak to me in Enochian, and I would repeat it. I was recording on my phone um, the entire time the vision. So each vision resulted in an audio recording where I would describe everything that was happening. And that included all the Enochian that was spoke to me, spoken to me. The strange thing is that contrary to the practice I normally would, would have for myself and what I would encourage any of, I didn't get these until I'd done the entire series of 30 visions. I would get Enochian paragraphs of Enochian spoken to me in these visions, I would record them in on audio and trans, transcribe them onto paper, but I didn't translate them into English using largely using Laycock's work, the Enochian Dictionary, um, until I'd done all 30 visions. What that means is, and I, I, I guess I did that because maybe I didn't have enough confidence that I was getting something important or real. Um, I probably should have translated them at each step, you know, but since I didn't, what that allowed me to do in retrospect is realize that I was getting communications in one aether that were predicting what was going to happen in a later aether. But since I hadn't translated it, I couldn't have known that. It couldn't, I couldn't have been self-fulfilling where, you know, and the example I'm going to give in the 27th aether in October of 2007, I got this spoken to me in Enochian, and this is a translation that I later did. Aziz I am, that's the name of the guide I had at the time. In Zipe, which is the 27th, or sorry, is the ninth aether. 
In Zippe, all things have their continuance. All truth is clothed therein. In faith, carry out the balancing. Into the cup of thy oath, the blood will descend. Open the mysteries of your creation and appear as a whore. In the mysteries of your creation, in faith, she lives. In the shrine of the winds of wisdom. Um, so this was October 2007, during my vision of the 27th Aether. I did not get this into English until much later, much later, including after I actually did the ninth vision, two years later. And the predicted experiences with the grail and the blood and something, an experience that ties in with the um, receptivity of the horror archetype. Um, all of this happened in the ninth aether as predicted in the 27th aether. But since I had not done the translation yet at the time of this vision, it shows that I couldn't have consciously tried to do what was supposed to happen. I could not have guided the vision to be what, it, what I thought was supposed to be there. So for me, this is one of the important validations of the system. Uh, and and the, the methods I was using um, that I actually would not have had access to if I had done the translations as I probably should have all along the way. Um, another thing that happened is I started to get symbols gradually described and revealed, including probably most importantly this one, which I now call the sacred triad of the 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 concepts of Keros, Topos, and Nous. Um, this was revealed over the, the course of several aethers. And by the way, all of this, all these visions are recorded and available in my book called The Winds of Wisdom, which is drawn from, from one of those statements in the 27th aether. Um, so as I was saying, I, I started to get material that I would not have thought of myself. There are implications in this symbol um, concerning a system of magic. Um, there are symbols like the cross emblem in, at the center that um, had further mysteries that were revealed and have been um, expanded on in Temple of the Silver Star. Um, so I'm not smart enough to come up with everything <laughs> that was shown to me. And that is another thing that for me validates this method of working. Now, um, I wanna back up here away from my personal experience and talk a little bit more about um, how I was conceiving of the Aethers and how, and how others have also done it. Um, think of the 30 Aethers um, as a set of concentric rings surrounding the earth. So, Imagine that the very center of this diagram is the Earth, and then the next ring out is the 30th Aether, and the next one beyond that is the 29th, and so on. So uh, the 30th Aether would be the one you would start with and would be the one closest to Earth in the sense of the astral realms you're exploring. The theory would be that it would be that sort of the most manifest. Also, um, in terms of each aether, um, the working model I adopted was that aethers one through ten would be Kether through Malkuth in Atsaluth, that aethers eleven through twenty would be Kether through Malkuth in Bria, and that aethers twenty one through thirty would be Kether through Malkuth in Yetzira. And so the nature of the vision I would expect would be characterized by the, the, the Sephira. Um, for example, I would expect the 13th Aether, Zime, to have something to do with Bina, since that would be Bina in Bria. Um, similarly, the, the um, the governors of each aether, there are three governors for each aether except the 30th, which has four governors. And those governors names appear on various elemental tablets. So you can see on this chart that um, I show which tablets the names appear on. 
Um, and so I would expect the, the nature of the vision to be also influenced by which tablet was involved. Some of them have multiple tablets, as you can see there. Finally, um, as I would when I showed you that that chart before, um, with the alphabet and the different attributions, um, the, the name of each aether, if you take the Enochian letters that spell the name of each aether, each of those is going to have uh, an astrological attribution and a uh, tarot trump that would be associated with it. So you can use those tarot trumps, as, as you can see in the vision and the voice also with Crowley, you can, you can see sometimes that those tarot trumps shape the vision and you can use all of these keys like the, the sphere involved, the tablets involved, the keys from the name of the Aether, the tarot trumps. You can use these as you go into the vision to sort of plant some seeds for what's going to develop uh, to sort of unlock deeper vision of the Aether. By the way, I used only, and, and what we use today in AA and Temple of Silver Star, the reformed tablets. Um, so the final iteration of the tablets from Dee and Kelly. And the governor's names have been corrected to conform to the reformed tablets as well. So, um, so if you find the reform tablets, which you can which you can find among other places in Lon Duquette's book, Enochian Vision Magic, um, then these governor's names will will be correct to those reform tablets. Okay. Now let's uh, come back and look at some of the tools needed. It's actually very simple, um, pleasantly simple. If you've been doing temple and from the Golden Dawn type tradition with a million uh, objects of various complexity needed to do things. It's kind of refreshing to just have an altar or table for the Nokian tablets. A candle's nice, it's optional, but it's helpful for the atmosphere. The tablet of union and the tablet or tablets with the governor's names for the Aether you're about to uh, scry. Um, if you prefer, you can have a scrying mirror or a stone or a basin of water or something like that. Crowley was staring into the topaz gem uh, on the, at the center of a cross that he had. Um, but you can also do this without any um, scrying apparatus at all by simply treating it as an internal visionary astral scrying experience. So just as you would uh, normally scry a region by uh, the techniques I'll describe in more detail in a minute. Here's the Tablet of Union um, in a condensed form that I find useful. And as an example, here's the, the Tablet of Water. I, my, my tablets that I use are all uh, lettered in Enochian, the Reform tablets um, with the sigil of the kings at the top. So here is the working method I used, and this is described in full in The Winds of Wisdom also. Avoid eating for several hours before. Avoid uh, sexual release for 12 hours before. These are recommendations. Prepare via ritual bathing. Put on the robe and regalia of your degree or grade as desired. Perform preparatory relaxation and gentle breathing for a few minutes. Prepare the space with lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram and lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram or similar. Um, in this case, things like this, the star ruby would work fine as a pentagram banishing, but the star sapphire to me is, is purely an invoking ritual and does not have the banishing effect of a classic lesser banishing ritual of the hexagram. You want to clear the space of elemental, planetary, and zodiacal influences since 
elements, zodiac, and planets are so intrinsic to the symbol sets we're using. You don't want the astral space you're in to be colored already by other forces. You want to bring in just the one that you're wanting to focus on. Some sort of energetic amplification like a middle pillar or pranayama. Read or recite the second call to create receptive consciousness. This is something I've found to work very well using the second call specifically. This is one reason why you have the tablet of union there. The second call um, creates a certain receptive consciousness that opens you up to whatever comes next. And what's next would be that using the 19th call, inserting the name of the specific uh, specific aether you're going to scry. Do an etheric projection, which I'll explain more about in a minute. Rise high straight up until you get to a space to explore. Chant the governor's names. I found rhythmic chanting works well for this. And I've done that in group scryings as well. You're trying to intens intensify the vision as much as possible with building up some uh, intensity with the chanting. Uh, use the key correspondences from the letters of the Aether's name, as I was saying. So you would have three tri uh, tarot trumps and uh, their associated natures connected with that. You could even have the tarot trumps laid out on the altar. That'd be a good idea. Call for a guide and do the usual testing of the guide. I'll describe more about that in a minute. Scry as long as you desire. Then uh, do something that is the equivalent of returning to your body, returning to your sense of here and now and in, in this space. And do a classical license to depart, you know, something like, um, in the name of Rahurquid, I now set free any spirits which may have been imprisoned by this ceremony. Depart in peace unto your abodes and habitations. Be there peace between us and be ready to come when called. Do a single knock and feel the space clear. And then if you feel like more clearing is needed, you can do more banishings, like repeating an LBRP and LBRH. But uh, you can decide at the moment if it feels necessary. Um, I, um, for the calls, I recommend that you always read them in Enochian and if you wish also in English or Portuguese, but, um, at least Enochian, I think they have their greatest potency when, when read in Enochian, um, you can read the calls multiple times, um, you can recite, the, you can chant the governor's names multiple times. You can have multiple guides that you work with. So there's really no rules about this other than show good sense in your magical hygiene. So um, here are some other suggestions that, for use in astral work, regardless of the system you're using. So this. This would be any sort of scrying, um, whether or not it's the aethers. Uh, so you're starting with etheric projection. Externalize a force outside of your body. Shape it into um, an etheric double of yourself, which might be um, you robed in your in the robe of your grade and, and sort of appearing as an idealized uh, version of yourself as, as a magician. And then transfer your consciousness into that etheric double. Once you are able to move around the room and uh, feel yourself in that etheric double, then start rising straight up into the air. And this is where we sort of bridge from an etheric projection into an astral projection. Um, you're not dealing with forms that are simply uh, modeled around the physical room you're in, but in entirely different landscapes and regions altogether. So you rise straight up um, as high as you can um, until you seem to get somewhere. There should be a, a landscape that appears or uh, a figure of some kind, an entity, or simply a sense that you've gotten where you need to go. 
this is where it may be useful to think of the tarot cards or the astrological regions that that probably are involved based on the name of the aether. Call for a guide um, and test them with usual procedures. You can get uh, various suggestions from Crowley on how to do this, like in his notes for an astral atlas, uh, also in Libra O. So you might want to test an entity with grade signs or say, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law to it, and it should respond with love as the law, love under will. If you get something that seems false, just draw a banishing pentagram and send it away. In any case, uh, if a guide appears and you and they pass your tests, you're satisfied they're real, um, then uh, ask for their name, ask for the spelling of the name. Um, compare the name to what you know of Gamatria and the symbols that you expect to be keyed to this region. So if you're exploring a region that uh, is drawn from the fire tablet and you get, you get to a watery landscape, you might not be in the right place. Or you, if you get a guide that seems to be of a different element, um, you might not be in the right place. Um, if something is bothering you, <laughs> harassing you, um, grow yourself very large and take the form of Rahorquit and banish it. Um, it will not, it will not bother you after that. But do whatever other exploration you wish. Um, you might repeat the governor's names. You might, uh, um, again, repeat the, the the calling to mind of the tarot trumps that maybe are related to the region you're scrying. Just use your own creativity and ingenuity to to explore. And when you feel like you're ready, um, don't don't get too fatigued. But when it feels like okay, this is starting to to be enough, um, thank your guides. You want to be friends with them so that they come to you again if you visit again. Um, ask for any final instructions. Uh, all along the way, uh, anytime you can ask for the lessons of the region you're visiting, that's a good idea because that's ultimately what you're trying to do, right? You're trying to extract the information you need to extract from exploring this place. So ask them what what is important for you to know what's important for you to learn here you may get words you may get images you may go on a journey with the guide this happened quite a bit in my visions where it would be um you know might start in some sort of pyramid but then i'd be shown around different parts of the pyramid or we'd go up into the sky and go look at something or you know all kinds of stuff happens um, but then eventually you're going to return to your body, um, feel yourself slowly coming down through the astral realm, back to earth, back into your physical body. It's a good idea to visualize your astral form sort of sitting down into your body. You may want to um, slowly sort of move your muscles, give a kind of silence, do something that kind of seals you back into your body. Um, I really recommend audio recording of these visions because you'll just capture more of it. You'll capture even the, the emotion in your voice. And sometimes your voice will sound very different, uh, oddly different when you are repeating what is said to you. In fact, in my vision, sometimes, sometimes it felt like I wasn't repeating what was said to me. I was saying it as it was said to me. So it was, it was almost like the entity had taken over my mouth for a moment and was just saying what it needed to say, and that would get recorded. And that included Enochian, which I did not understand. Um, so pretty, pretty striking. So this is a summary of it. For if, uh, as an example of the 30th Aether of Texae, um, you can see the spelling at the top in Enochian. Those three Enochian letters correspond to the moon, Virgo, and Earth. Uh, therefore, the priestess, hermit, and universe trumps. So that would be some, those would be keys for this particular vision. Those four governor's names. Um, 
those are the four governors of Texas, and it, the names are drawn from the tablet of water. So you'd have the tablet of union, the tablet of water, and you'd be chanting these governors' names over and over again. And what's what appears there after the governors' names in Enochian, or you know, English lettering of the Enochian, um, would be the phonetic pronunciation if you were doing the, the chanting. So for the first one, you know, ta a o ge ba, for example. Okay. Um, let's come back to the sacred triad. I want to talk about the material that came through in these visions, not because I expect you to believe that this is necessarily important for you, but it certainly was important for me, and it became important in terms of the way I was constructing and developing the system of the Temple of the Silver Star and uh, bringing the results of these visions into that system. Um, I've integrated this material into Temple of the Silver Star with specific practices. Um, there's, there's meditative work based on this. There is theoretical discussion of it. There is magical practice, magical ritual work that comes from this, and there are devotional elements. Um, the sacred triad is Keros, which is like sacred time, um, contrasted with Kronos, which is clock time. Keros is sacred time, and, and that's, these aren't words that I invented or that the, the visions presented out of nowhere, obviously, but um, these Greek words are keys to ways of conceptualizing things that, that were new. Um, Sacred time is like uh, if, if you're doing a ritual and you realize you've gotten to the point where the ritual needs to come to a climax, it's not, it's not the time for it to climax because it is 3.07 on the clock. It is time for it to climax because it's the right time in terms of the action, in terms of the way it feels, in terms of your intuition about needing to happen. Another good example of this that I like to give is, you know, if you're on a date with someone special and you realize the time is right to give them a kiss, it certainly was not the right time because you looked at your watch and realized that 12, 16 would be just the right time. It's the right time because it's the right time. You know, the universe told you, <laughs> right? So that's sacred time. That's Kairos. This uh, is the point at the bottom right that's universal mind uh, that is also the in a, in a magical ritual you know if you've picked the right time to do it which is kairos you need to have the right content um, the right magical principles and procedures your method as a reflection of universal will that you're enacting that's noose finally topos is not just the place of the working and the temple you're in, but the object of the working. So what's the target? What's the aim? Is it transformation of yourself? Is it consecration of a talisman or another thing? And each of these points interacts with each of the others. That's why the triangle form is convenient. So there is an interaction between the timing and the place or the aim. There is an interaction between the method and the timing. There's an interaction between the object of the working and the method. So uh, you can develop rituals with this triadic formula in unique ways. And that's, again, fleshed out in the Temple of the Silver Stars work. Then um, at the center, the serpent cross, um, that has many layers of symbolism, but it also ended up becoming the jewel uh, that First Order members are given in the Temple of the Silver Star. So um, sort of a, a making concrete of things that's first started in this visionary work. So um, that's most of, of my uh, discussion and presentation for today. I just want to leave you with uh, some resources.
certainly the vision and the voice. Um, the the and Kelly source materials like uh, the the text called a true and faithful relation of what passed between Dr. John D and some spirits, uh, these diaries and so on. There's many good good uh, modern adaptations. Uh, Lon Duquette's Enochian Vision Magic. Donald Laycock, uh, the complete Enochian Dictionary. Colin Campbell, uh, the Magic Seal of Dr. John D. And my own Winds of Wisdom and Living Thelema. Um, for training in these approaches, I've mentioned a few times. Uh, AA, you can find us at onestarinsight.org and Temple of the Silver Star at totss.org. We have uh, acad academic track campus for study in the Portuguese language in Brazil. Um, and uh, at this time, initiatory work in Temple of the Silver Star is, is, uh, requires spoken and written fluency in English. Um, we hope that eventually changes at some point. Okay, so at this point, I'm going to um, back out of this presentation so that I can see the rest of you and see comments and such, and I'll uh, be happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you. I'm going, uh, some of the questions are going to come in Portuguese. We have at least one already, uh, oh, sorry. Some of these questions will come in Portuguese, others will come in English. I'll do the translation okay. for you. Okay. But before before entering the questions, I'd like to to ask you uh, about the Temple of the Silver Star. Uh, how would hmm. uh, how would a Brazilian who just loves your work uh, do the work of the Temple of Silver Stars from from here? What, how would that work? Okay. Um... First, first of all, we all also do have uh, AA representatives in Brazil uh, as well. But for Temple of the Silver Star specifically, um, there are two tracks. The academic track is non-initiatory. So this would be good uh, foundational work for somebody who wanted to get some structured assistance with a single mentor, a single teacher. Um, there are ritual practices, meditations, written work. Um, and such, uh, and contact can be uh, on webcam. So travel is not necessary for the academic track. Um, and uh, the application is online at totss.org. Um, for the initiatory track, which as the name implies is initiatory, um, we are just kind of planting the seeds for that in, in Brazil at this time. So what needs to happen first is that individuals would, would very likely need to come to the U.S. for initiation. But then once there are enough people in Brazil close enough together to start working as a group, then it becomes more possible to, to do local initiatory work there. And we could come down um, from the U.S. and you know bring a team of people to do initiations down there in Brazil. It could also work that way if there are enough people in Brazil who are um, ready to work in the initiatory track and have applied to do so um, and, you know, get accepted for initiation, then maybe we could come down and do initiations there for all of those people so they would not all have to come to the U.S. first. Um, but again, for, for that right now, we just have so much written material and the need for our order leaders to teach in English that I'm afraid we're limited to written and spoken English for the initiatory part at this point. And that application is also online at, at uh, tots.org. That, that would be the, the pioneer generation, right? Right. The pioneers. Right. Uh, <laughs> the pioneers. The have brave. To do. <laughs> yeah. So we do have questions. Uh, so uh, Max Sirius asks, I have a question, obviously, what he thinks, what do you think is the importance of the eight year work for one within the AA before reaching knowledge and conversation? 
great question. Um, all of the work in the the grades of AA before knowledge and conversation are, to me, and I think this is quite intentional from Crowley, they are tools to help with knowledge and conversation. You're not necessarily using Enochian for its own sake as much as practicing getting your mind to work in symbolic ways and to translate from these deeply symbolic realms into something that you can consciously understand. Because until you have trained yourself to be able to do that, it's going to be harder to listen to what your angel is telling you. Uh, so initially we encounter teachings from our own holy guardian angel through symbols and the unconscious and dreams and intuition, uh, not as much directly into the brain. So like consciously in normal language. So by doing things like Enochian scrying or any sort of scrying, we are training our muscles of astral perception so that we are better able to eventually have knowledge and conversation. Same goes with magical tools that we need to practice in order to do uh, our invocation of the angel. And the same with energetic tools like pranayama and so on. We have to practice that so that we're better able to fire ourselves up with kundalini force or whatever term you want to use uh, in order to fuel our work with the angel. I talk about this a lot in the chapter of Living Thelema called The Methods and Tools of AA. So good question. We have another question. Um... It's more of a request. Could you give us your vision about the changes in the Great Table from 1854 and 1857? Very technical question on the on John Dee's work. <laughs> I'm going to pass on that one. That's that's a little bit a little bit too specific. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I'm I'm trusting this guy. I have no idea what he's talking about. But I do think, Ulysses, that you may, if you are you are entering this territory, find the the, the recently published, uh, what do, how do you call that, uh, the that recently edited manuscripts from from John Dee. There's a, a collection for two volumes. Maybe that's where yes. you're gonna find such such stuff. Yes, lots of lots of new versions um, with uh, you know addressing things that have needed to be corrected for quite some time. So guys, there are lots uh, of, plenty of errors in Lieber Hanok, for example. This, are those intentional? Do you think uh, people like to think Crowley puts traps in his books? Um, I don't have a strong opinion on that with regard to Lieber Hanok. I, I, it's clear in other places that he is telling partial truths, uh, you know, but. Uh, I think with Hanok, it's, it's probably more of a defect of his source materials. Yeah, there were uh, typographical errors in in first editions from Class A materials, so right, that would right. not be intentional. Right. So João Henrique asks, uh, "I have great difficulty getting any vision. What exercises can I do to get it?" Um, more visions. <laughs> uh, just keep practicing. Um, now, that said, some people will never be very good at the visual aspect of things. Some people have, will always have a hard time seeing a, a pentagram that they've drawn uh, or um, focusing on a, a visual image during a meditation, for example. But others... Uh, that'll come easy, but they'll have a very hard time with some other part of magical work, like the pranayama or whatever. So don't don't worry that being you know having some weakness in a particular area will stop you from doing this work. But but don't um, don't stop yourself from continuing to practice those areas because otherwise you'll only be practicing things you're good at, and you'll be ignoring things that need practice. So keep practicing um, scrying and, and any, any sort of astral projection work that you can do 
um, try different techniques of getting there, different, you know, you may try a vision using a bowl of water or, or a magic mirror or try a vision just closing your eyes and doing it all internally. Use whatever tools you can and just keep practicing. Uh, Rafael Serra asks, uh, everyone will find new things when practicing Enochian. Oh, that's a question? Yeah, yeah, it sounded, uh, it's it formulated a little. These guys are translating for me and I'm reading them uh, as they are written. I, th I, meant, I, th I think that he means to say, is, is everyone who goes to the eight years going to find something new? Or it may be that one day we're going to just get the same stuff, everybody. Um, I, th I think of it sort of like, um, you know, in, in the corner of your room, if there is a coat hanger, a, a, a coat rack, there are all these pegs sticking off that coat rack. And those are the same pegs, no matter what coats you put on it. But the coat you put on it is yours and yours alone. So I think with the, with the Enochian Aethers, there are basic forms that will define the 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 nature of that realm but how you clothe those symbols with detail will be very much individual it's it's a bit like we understand what archetypes are from a jungian point of view that there are certain tendencies of 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 thought forms that then get clothed with individual experience and thought and feeling and symbol. Um, so everyone will get something that's unique to them, um, but we would expect that the tendencies of those things would be to fall under the, the same kind of categories you would expect for that particular region. Uh, now that, that reminds me to say something I intended to say earlier, which is in this system, if you're, if you're not ready for the vision, you might get garbage. You know, if, if you're not at an appropriate level of initiation and sensitivity to get what you might ideally get from the vision, it's not going to hurt you. You might just get something that's not very useful. So that's another way that um, a person could be trying to do some visionary work that they're just not ready for. And they might feel like, oh, I can't do this, but it might just be that you're not ready to do it yet. And when the time is right, you'll get much more of a vision. We have a very related question from Lose Your Illusions. Uh, do the Enochian works, um, uh, do you see the Enochian works being incorporated as part of the AA structure? Or is it something that's just related? Well, you see, um, you see uh, Libra Hanok assigned to the practicus. Um, but as I was saying earlier, any particular um, aspirant may decide they want to specialize in deeper work in the Enochian system, or you may, let's say you're, you're a practicus and your supervising philosophus happens to be an expert in the Enochian part of the system, you might get more training on Enochian than you would from some other supervising initiate. Um, but the basics of the system will always contain some Enochian work. Um, part, part of the task and the challenge of any of us working the AA system today is to flesh out into a structure of training the uh, sort of basics that Crowley left us. He left us bullet points of the things needing to be covered and sometimes training documents that go into more detail. But in a lot of places, you can, you can tell that he was assuming that each person doing the teaching would bring everything they knew to the table to flesh it out and to help the people they were teaching. Uh, in more detailed ways. So uh, I guess that's that's a general comment on the system. 
Uh, this one I will try to translate. Um, is there any importance? I mean, I mean, I, I think he meant to ask if there is importance for the probationist to do the Enochian works, or if this is something that is a I don't know. I, I'm not sure what he meant. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm trying to. I'm trying to understand. Mm. Is it important for the probationist to do a complete vision, or is it, or is it acceptable for the probationist to just try and ju to just get it going and, and and wait for it to develop in, along the way? The probationer is assigned to try a lot of things, a little bit. <laughs> So the probationer will sample a lot of things and probably not get very good at any of them. And that's okay. The, uh, in my view, the, the purpose of the probation is to establish a routine of daily practice and diary keeping, to acquaint oneself with all of the material in the, in the curriculum so that the neophyte who's supervising can determine if if this person is going to do the work and is going to, to stick to it but also very importantly so that when that probationer becomes a neophyte and then is supervising their own probationer and that probationer comes with a question about one of these practices that neophyte needs to have tried it a little bit at least so that they can answer basic questions about that practice so for the example of the Enochian work, I would expect that probationers should probably at least try something from, from the body of the Enochian system, even if it's just once or twice, so that at least they have some familiarity with it. No, not mastery of it, not deep understanding, not exalted initiatory visions, but just trying it. Uh, similarly, um, you know, someone, a probationer who's spent one year practicing some basic uh, meditation techniques is not going to have not very likely to have um, a very uh, they're not going to be an, an advanced meditation practitioner but when they're supervising somebody who's just getting started they'll be able to answer basic questions like what do you do if you get a cramp in your leg <laughs> what do you do if you're trying to visualize a triangle and it keeps spinning around, you know, you'll, you just need to be able to answer basic questions. Uh, Cissa Mello asks us uh, that she, she contextualizes, there's a lot of people who says that the Enochian is dangerous mm -hmm. and that you should not do it because it is dangerous. So it should be reserved to somebody with more experience or being guided by someone with more experience. And then she asks, what do you think about this? My experience of the entities involved in the Enochian system is that they are interested in helping us. I have never had an experience with this system that suggested to me that there was anything, any, any entities in, involved that uh, had negative intentions, uh, harmful intentions. Um, I think the most likely outcome, if someone attempts this work before they're really inwardly ready to, is that they simply won't get much useful result. Um, I do think, for that reason, it's it makes a lot of sense to to focus on other foundational practices first, and to work for quite some time, years, with a lot of other more basic practices so that you're better able to do Enochian work and other more advanced work. It's not a question of harm as much as um, readiness. Uh, like with a physical exercise, you could just jump in and do a more advanced, uh, you know, try, try to run a marathon after you, you uh, just started uh, running a week ago. But um, you won't be able to, you know, you won't be able to do it. Uh, so pacing yourself and having a structure and um, learning from someone who's already mastered it is very helpful. Uh, Lucas Alberto asks another 
Ah, this is another interesting question about the, 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 the technical aspects. What do you think about the many versions of the Sigilum AI myth? Is there a better version, the most correct? Um, I think I would just generally say, I, I, again, that's a very specific question, but uh, I, I would say if you turn to the more recent, uh, more recently released books that have presented the Enochian system and corrected errors that have persisted over over the years, I, I think you'll be fine. I wouldn't I wouldn't get um, too worried about that. João Henrique asks one of those polemical questions about astral beings. What do you personally think that the Enochian entities are? Um, there seem to be, two, the, this is my opinion, okay, I'm not trying to say what is true, you know, for everyone. Uh, they, they, these beings seem to be independent of human consciousness but able to connect to it they seem to be linked to specific aspects of reality connected with the aether in in question um, they seem to be um, they seem to be tasked with helping humanity um, and while all that feels true to me, based on my experience, it would not bother me if someone came along and said that they were merely aspects of my own mind that I was unfamiliar with. That's not the way it feels to me, but someone could take that entirely materialistic sort of psychological approach to it and still get a lot out of the system. The, the good part of that, and I get similar questions about the, the Holy Guardian Angel. Is this just a part of us or is this an external being? Um, the, the, the good news is that when you do the work, you get all the answers you need about it because your experience tells you what you need to know. Um, it won't help if someone has told you, oh, it's an external being or, oh, it's just a part of your mind. That won't matter. Uh, unless you've let those expectations limit you. So I, I just tell you what it seemed like to me, and I encourage everyone to come to their own conclusions through practice. About this, this sort of uh, questions, I have one of my own, which is about the, the, the similarities and differences of these two uh, concepts, the eight years and the astral plane. We have this very broad conception of the astral plane and yeah. then a very broad kind of technique, which is the, the journey on the astral plane. There's a lot of techniques which, which fall in the same sort of category. What, what do you think about the relationship? Do you think that the eight years are one kind of astral uh, journey or are they uh, meaningfully different? I mean, not in not in intensity but in quality hmm. um, for me the the astral world is simply the world of thought uh, the world of mind outside of physicality and so there might be many different ways of organizing an approach to that world and the enochian aethers are in my experience simply one of the better organized versions of that so you know, you could you could um, do scryings just based on the Sephiroth of, of the Tree of Life. You could do scryings based on, you know, Crowley gives examples of this, you know, uh, scryings based on certain mythologies where you would expect the pantheon of Norse mythology to be in a certain realm or whatever. Um, these are just more or less artificial ways of structuring your exploration of these realms. But um, I, I think the the Enochian aethers are one example of of a of a uh, about an attempt at doing that that works better than many others. 
Thank you. I'm going to try and find if I skipped a question. I think I did skip a question. I, did, I think I did skip a question on purpose, but I'm going to bring it back now because Max Sirius asks a question that's going to your that's going to touch on your uh, practice as a therapist. Uh, what does Mr. Shoemaker hmm. thinks are the most important Jungian concepts magicians should look into? Um, probably the idea of the balance of the four elements and the way they relate to the four functions of the psyche. And that is built right into the AA system and the system of the Temple of the Silver Star, which particularly puts a lot of focus on psychological balancing and health um, for magicians. Uh, so, so approaching magical work with an idea of addressing all of the four functions of the psyche, thinking, feeling, sensing, and intuition. Um, also the model of the psyche that allows us to understand the unconscious as a connection point to higher super consciousness. Um, so the, the, the model that allows us to look at the nefesh and the personal unconscious as a, um, as a viewing point for beginning work into instructions from higher realms like the Holy Guardian Angels. So I think the Jungian model of the psyche does a pretty good job of, of helping us uh, grasp that. For example, in Jung's work on, on dealing with synchronicity and dream interpretation and the importance of listening to intuition uh, in our day-to-day -day lives. So I would say that the four elements and the aspects of the psyche and then the general model of personal and collective unconscious uh, are probably most important. Okay, I think I'm going to uh, search for one more question before we, we, we finish our event. We have another question for Max. Do you think Enochian obeys a specific aesthetic an aesthetic of, uh, of his own, I think, or it depends on the practitioner? Um, I, I think that's a similar answer to the other question about uh, do we all get something new from it, like something unique from it? Um, I think it's inevitable that, that um, everyone will also bring their own aesthetic to to it, uh, not intentionally necessarily, but look, everyone has their own mind, right? So their own mind will be a channel through which all of these things manifest and whatever predispositions of mind that you have will color the vision you get. But um, I don't know if I would say that there is a specific aesthetic inherent to the aethers i would say there's a specific um like in other words i don't i don't think the visions tend to be this kind of thing more than that kind of thing um you know the you wouldn't say that the enochian visions tend the aether visions tend to be you know it always involves a landscape or it always involves um guides taking you somewhere or something uh i think that's that's too specific but i do think that what can, we can generalize about is the, is the intention of the beings there in my experience being that of of wanting to help humanity so to the extent that that's an aesthetic i suppose uh, we could say that Okay, guys, I think that's that's all for questions for today. David, I did ask you about uh, the temple of the Silver Star before, but I, I do want to ask mm -hmm. you about your, if your work with the AA, how can, I, how can I put this? You actually did say this before. I would just like to clarify. Uh, do you or your closest disciples, are you accepting students from Brazil if, if one, one person would like to contact you? Yes. Um, you can go to onestarinsight.org uh, uh, and write to the Cancellarius. 
um, indicate that you are in Brazil. And uh, if you prefer uh, English or Portuguese language, um, we do instruct uh, in Portuguese in Brazil for AA. So um, um, the classic student program is available where you acquire the books uh, on the list we provide you and study them for at least three months. And if you pass an exam on those books, then you're uh, offered admission as a probationer. So um, you can write to the, the cancellarius at onestarinsight.org. It's great. The, the, the world is getting smaller, right? Now you have email. <laughs> It's much That's quicker right. for us to speak to one another. Dave, Dad, would like to, to thank you again so very much for you being here with us today. Uh, your work is excellent. We all love it. We all have your books, man. So if you would like to give us uh, your last words, that would be great. Well, mostly thank you um, for having me on. And thanks to everyone who was here and listened to me uh, rant for a while. Um, but if, if I can, if I can leave everyone with, with one thing, it would be, um, to trust that if you just keep up your work through the frustrations you'll inevitably have, um, if you, if you believe that you can grow and advance in this system and you don't stop working, um, you will have success. Uh, I've never seen anyone do the system and fail. I've seen them fail by stopping. So don't give it up, keep up your work, um, get help with teachers or training systems if that's what feels right to you. Um, and uh, in, in that regard, whether you seek out an organization I'm involved with or some other organization or no organization, um, I just want you to find a spiritual home that is fruitful for you uh, and uh, and I encourage you to, to never stop in your, in your uh, aspiration. So thank you for, for being here. Thank you. Pessoal, então esse é o último dia, esse foi o último dia da nossa conferência. Uh, agradeço muito a presença de todos. Espero que vocês tenham aproveitado. Né? Esse ano a gente teve um evento um, pouco mais, um pouquinho menos é, preenchido. Né? No ano passado a gente teve uma atividade muito longa no sábado. Né? Mas eu espero que no ano que vem a gente possa trazer mais pesquisa, que as pessoas se animem a submeter mais pesquisas, pesquisas que elas estiverem fazendo. Lembrando a todos que essa gravação vai ficar no YouTube. Né? Então todos esses, esses três dias de trabalho vão ficar registrados para a posteridade a gente faz questão de deixar o nosso canal lá é, registrado sem monetização, esse trabalho não é um trabalho que vai ser monetizado jamais. Em breve, os trabalhos escritos e os slides vão ser colocados num sitezinho que a gente criou para esse evento, e o link dessas coisas todas vão ser colocados na descrição dos vídeos. Tá? Então, pessoal, agradeço mais uma vez a presença de todos, e até o ano que vem. <música>